Amen. All right, turn with me to Revelation 10. Uh, this is kind of like the halftime of a football game in Revelation 10. We have a break in the action. Um, uh, you know, this is speaking of, you know, football and halftime. Uh, you know how it's been for a lot of people, you know, the first half of their lives. A lot of times there's ups, there's downs, there's hard times, there's good times. There's, you know, people say, how's ministry going? I always say, it's ministry. <laughs> you figure it out. Yeah, I mean, there's great times and there's down times. I mean, 2022 is great in some ways, difficult in others. You know, there's people going through cancer, people coming out of cancer, uh, loved ones that have passed away, you know, marriages that are awesome, babies born. So there's always good, there's always hard, there's always different things. Um, we're in a season where, you know, we're in a tunnel and there's light at the end of the tunnel. For some of you, you're in a tunnel still and it's still pretty dark. Uh, maybe some of you have wayward children, prodigal sons and daughters, um, different health things that you're dealing with. So you want to make sure you stay close to the Lord. Uh, there's a lot of heartache and, and discouragement in the world around us. But at the same time, Jesus does promise, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Uh, Hebrews 13.5, he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'm with you always at the end of Matthew uh, uh, even to the end of this age. So whatever season you're going through, um, God's on the throne, and He loves you. He won't give up on you. Um, like I said, it's kind of like a chapter 10 is a break in the action, kind of like a halftime in a football game. And uh, speaking of, you know, football, I know it's been a rough year for the Broncos. Um but you know, what do the Denver Broncos and possums have in common? Uh, they like to play dead at home, but they usually they usually get killed on the road. <laughs> so there's my corn, corny joke for the day. Um, but a lot of us, you know, we're going through or coming out of that dark tunnel. We look behind us in the rearview mirror and we say, "Thank you, Lord, for getting me through it. Thank you for." being in the midst of whatever you were facing. And that's kind of what we see in chapter 10. Again, chapter 6, 8, and 9 were brutal. You know, the great tribulation taking place. Jesus has opened the scroll with the seven seals on it. And we saw in chapter 6, a fourth of the world's population is killed during the first four judgments of four seals. Uh, we saw it with the trumpet blast that came after the seven seal was open in chapters 8 and 9. Another third of the world was destroyed. At the end of chapter 9, we saw these four demonic you know, creatures that were let loose, and they killed a third of all the people on planet Earth. So this is a very, very dark time in the book of Revelation. But this is, again, a break in the action. It's kind of a light at the end of the tunnel. Here in chapter 10, Jesus gives us a reminder that everything is in control. Everything is on schedule. Um, there is hope. We're not going through the Great Tribulation, but those who do, it is going to be brutal beyond comprehension. Um, we pick up in the chronology of the book of Revelation in chapter 11, verse 15. But here we have what's known as a parenthetical chapter, where we're given some additional insights and, again, some encouraging words. I'm sure the Apostle John was very excited when he hears what happens here in chapter 10 as he's part of this scene, uh, as he's been part of the whole scenario so far. Um, this is a time for John to catch his breath. The Lord reminds him once again that everything is going exactly as it's planned during this time. So look at chapter 10, verse 1. We saw the horrendous trials of chapters 8 and 9. And then he says, I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud. And a rainbow was on his head. His feet, or his face, was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of of fire. So you go through this and you can read a lot of different commentaries and everybody gives you different opinions on who they think this mighty angel is. Some say it's Michael the archangel. 
Uh, that's a possibility. Some say this is Jesus himself because the description sounds very similar to what we read in chapter 1. And as he described himself in his glorified state, a lot of these things fit. I don't like to ascribe any name to this mighty angel because as it says here, this is a another mighty angel. And the word another means another of the same kind. And so... Um, Jesus speaks of the Holy Spirit as another helper. In John chapter 14, verse 16, Jesus says of the Holy Spirit, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper, same word, that he may abide with you forever. And so the Holy Spirit is another helper or comforter who is the same as just like Jesus because he is a third person of the Holy Trinity. So he comes and he is exactly like Jesus. He reveals the heart of the Father to us. He is another of the same kind. So here John sees another mighty angel. The last time he saw a mighty angel was in chapter 5, verse 2. And that angel is the one who asks the question, Who is worthy to take the scroll and unloose its seals? And remember John says, no, and it says, No one was in heaven found worthy. No one on earth was found worthy. John begins to weep. And then the Lamb of God steps forward, Jesus. He alone is worthy. So he's called in chapter 5, verse 2, a strong angel. This one, mighty angel. The Greek word for strong and mighty is exactly the same. So this is the next mighty angel. Be that as it may, this is a scene that the Apostle John was extremely grateful to see because this, uh, this mighty angel is representing Christ. And he gives John here a sneak preview of what Jesus is going to accomplish in the near future. Because again, we're about halfway through the Great Tribulation. At the end, Jesus comes back, roaring like a lion. He will set his feet upon the earth, Mount of Olives. He will destroy the enemies of God and set up his kingdom that will last for a thousand years. So this is kind of a preview of coming attractions. Notice the description again in verse 1. This mighty angel is clothed with a cloud. The scriptures speak a lot about clouds. Um, Jesus, when he ascended back up into heaven, it says he was caught up in the clouds. In chapter 19, verse 15, 11 on down, when we return with the, with the Lord at his second coming, it says he's coming with the clouds. And it's a picture of the saints clothed in fine linen, bright and clean, riding on white horses. So we're going to look like clouds behind the Lord, billowing as he comes forth at his second coming. In the Old Testament, Moses, um, yeah, Moses, after they built the tabernacle, and they're wandering in the wilderness, they had the cloud, the pillar of cloud by day to keep them safe in the desert heat, a uh, pillar of fire by night. But then when Solomon dedicates the temple, it says the, the cloud, the glory of the Lord, came upon the temple. It was so thick, the priests couldn't even work anymore. They couldn't minister in the temple. So that's a picture of the clouds here. Uh, notice it says a rainbow was upon the head of this mighty angel. Again, the original rainbow was set in the sky by the Lord after the flood of Noah. It was God's promise that he would never destroy the world again with a flood of water. He'll destroy it next time with fire, but his promise with the rainbow is, I'm not going to destroy the world with a flood. The rainbow emphasizes the mercy of God. And even in the midst of his judgments, God gives us mercy. If you've gone through discipline, God is still merciful. This world, even though it's, being going, it's going through the great tribulation of God's wrath, he still gives mercy, and we see this throughout the book of Revelation, calling people to come to Christ uh, from every tribe, tongue, nation, and people. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 2 says, In wrath remember mercy. That's what Habakkuk cries to the Lord. In wrath remember mercy. And God always does. Even though Satan does all he can to try and hide God's mercy and love from lost sinners of the world, the fact remains that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, he will forgive of their sins, he will save. He remembers mercy. You might be in rebellion against the Lord, you might be living contrary to God's word, you might be deserving of, as we all are, of God's wrath, but he is extending his hand of mercy to you. Remember the Philippian jailer? 
He was about to kill himself because he thought everybody escaped when the earthquake opened all the prison doors and Paul and Silas were there. And Paul says, do yourselves no harm, we're all here. And so the Philippian jailer says to Paul and Silas, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So Acts chapter 16, 31. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. That's a promise that God guarantees to everyone who comes to Christ humbly in faith. Notice also it says this angel's face was like the sun. This speaks of being in the presence of the Lord. Uh, Moses, when he was in the presence of the Lord on Mount Sinai, when he comes down, his face is glowing, and they put a bag over his head because they did, he didn't want them to see the glory disappear from him. But he, his face was glowing. Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration says his face was shining like the sun. Um, we see examples of that throughout the scriptures. And then finally, verse 1, it says, This mighty angel had feet like pillars of fire, which speaks of God's righteous judgment that is taking place during the Great Tribulation. Jesus had you know, feet like bronze, refined in the fire. And so again, it's a picture of his judgment, his righteous judgment. The bottom line here is that this mighty angel, as he comes down from heaven to earth, during the Great Tribulation, he's coming in the, pow the power, the authority of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, look at verse 2. He had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. Again, notice the mighty angel has a little book that is open in his hand. Is this the same scroll that Jesus has been holding as he has removed all seven seals? Uh, personally, I don't think it's the same one. Uh, the word scroll and book are the same in the Greek, but the word difference here is this is a little book or a little scroll. In other words, this is more like a smaller version of the original. Once again, I see this angel representing the Lord as he reminds the Apostle John and us, everything is going according to God's will. Sin is being judged. Wickedness is being dealt with. Unrighteousness is being purged from the earth. Notice how this angel sets his right foot on the sea, his left foot on the land. This signifies that Jesus is about to take possession, reclaim this planet back to the Father. Uh, we remember that this world has been handed over to Satan when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. Uh, it's like they gave the title deed back to Satan. Satan knows it. This planet is his in some respects. At the temptation, he takes Jesus on the high mountain and says, I'll give all this to you, Jesus, all the kingdoms of the earth, if you'll just bow down and worship me. So he had the authority to do that. Jesus refused to do that, obviously, but this is where he's reclaiming planet Earth back to himself. Wherever he puts his foot, his, you know, his feet, dry land on the sea, he's reclaiming this back to the Father. Now, Psalm 95, it's a, a wonderful worship song. It says in Psalm 95, verse 3, For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods, in his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. So this is a great picture of, uh, again, God's promise that he is going to reclaim this back to the Father. In Joshua, you read through the book of Joshua, and God's very clear to Moses first, and then to Joshua as he comes into the promised land. Wherever you put your feet, I'm going to give that to you. Joshua chapter 1, verse 3. Every place that the sole of your feet will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. So again, as his mighty angel reclaims this world back to the Father, look at verse 3. He cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roars. When he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now, what did they say? That's usually the first question people ask. And when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, 
But I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered, and do not write them. So this loud cry like the roar of a lion is a shout of triumph and victory. God is almost done with the great tribulation. You can almost taste the victory. And as a result, it says these seven thunders, they uttered their voices. And John hears them. He knows what they say because he's about to write it down. And then he says, no, 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 don't write this down. Seal it up. Now, he's just doing what he's told to do. Remember back in chapter 1, twice Jesus told him the things you see right in the book. And then he tells him in chapter 1, verse 19, write the things which you know were, things which are, things which will take place after these things. So John's been diligently writing everything down that he sees, that he hears, and he's about to do that now, and then all of a sudden this voice from heaven says, don't do it. Do not write this down. Good lesson for all of us. When God's word is silent about something, we should be silent as well. It's always fun to speculate about different things that are happening in the world. And we have been, we will continue to talk about things that look like they're going to happen in the near future. As we come into 2023, we're seeing all kinds of things lining up for the last days. Jesus wants us not to be ignorant of the signs of the seasons, the signs of the times. But we got to be careful we don't cross lines and say, this is what it is. This is what's going to happen. It's going to be exactly like this. I remember back in the 70s when I got saved and the Left Behind movie first came out and they got the, you know, fresh out of the, you know, technology was the barcode, you know, to put on food. Before that, everybody had to just do all this with every item you brought. You remember that when you were a kid? Any of you old enough? Go to a grocery store, they'd take the banana, they'd take the next item, and they'd have to do that. And instead of just scanning it, when the barcode came out, all Christians like, that's it, that's the mark of the beast. Barcode, right here, right there. And then it was great, because in the left behind, they had a big barcode on their forehead. And But it's a precursor. Those things are paving the way for what's coming. And we're getting so far advanced from that. I mean, they've been giving shots to dogs, you know, a little grain of rice under their paw, and you can track them. They've been doing this with military people. There's people in Sweden right now, they're lining up saying, yes, I want this under my skin, because they can just go up, it's their bank account, it's everything. They can unlock their door. Everything's on this little grain of size, grain of rice size little chip, and, and it's not the mark of the beast, but it's showing you we're getting very close. So when Jesus says, when you see these things begin to happen, Look up, your redemption draws near. So we're getting close. But at the same time, when the word is silent about something, we need to be silent as well. If God wanted us to know what these seven thunders uttered, then he would have not, you know, he would not have stopped John from writing this down. Don't forget Revelation 22, 18, Jesus promises that if you add to the things written in this book, he will add to you the plagues written in this book. So we don't want to add to or take away from the Word of God. Where God chooses not to give us every little detail about something, we need to accept the fact that God has given us all that we need for the here and now. He's given us all that we need to know He's coming at any moment. The trumpet could sound, and in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be caught out of here. We're going to be raptured. You know, we know these things because God's Word declares these things. Nobody knows the day or the hour. So back in 1988, when they came out with the book, 88 Reasons for 1988 to be the year of the rapture, that was wrong. There's people, you can Google it, there's people that have said, I know what the seven thunders said. God revealed it to me. No, He didn't. Don't believe it. Where He's silent, we got to stay silent. Be careful about these things. God has given us all things to, pertaining to life and godly living, here and now, that's what Peter says. Uh, Paul tells us this in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. In other words, God has not shortchanged us in any way. We would all be blessed to a greater degree if we would read through, and here's a good New Year's resolution, Read through God's Word, starting today, start reading through it. 
Spend time in the Word of God. I think we still have in the in the foyer those little cards. You want to find them? Are they out there on the table? If you can find them, Paige, stick them out there because there's a little go through the Bible in a year. And Calvary Chapel put these out years ago. We usually, I forgot, but we usually stick them out there on New Year's Day or right before. And you can actually read through the Word. And, and it's so important to spend time studying and reading the Scriptures that God has given us rather than spending all of our time speculating about what might happen, this possibly could happen. It's okay to do that, but don't neglect the Word of God. We need to feed upon the Word of God. This is how we're made healthy and strong and grow in our relationship with the Lord. As believers and followers of Christ, God's Word is the only source for absolute truth concerning His plans, His purposes for our lives, for this world, for everybody on planet Earth. And it's only within God's Word that we discover all the promises that He's given us like he'll never leave us or forsake us, I'm with you always, that in this world you'll have tribulation. Do you have that on your fridge yet? <laughs> Probably not. You know, well, anyway. What do these seven, seven thunders say? I have no idea. So don't ask me. We'll simply have to wait. Guess what? We'll be here hearing this for ourselves in chapter 10 when this happens. We'll get to hear it when it happens. We'll be there live. It's going to be glorious. Look at verse 5. The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer. Now, this is one of the biggest reasons I do not think this is Jesus Christ, but this is actually another mighty angel because he's swearing by one who is greater than him. You know, that's what angels would do. Obviously, you know, this angel hasn't created all things, but he's swearing by him who created all things. Well, who's that? Well, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They created everything. Uh, we know from Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God, the word God is Elohim, it's the plural of the singular, created the heavens and the earth. John chapter 1 verse 1, the apostle John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, said, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us in chapter 1, verse 14. But here we see the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things, notice, were made through him. And without him, without Jesus, nothing was made that was made. He's the creator of all things. So here in Revelation 10, this angel swears by another who is greater than himself. But if this was Jesus, he would have simply swore by himself. Does that make sense? Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13. I don't know if you got there yet, ladies, but maybe. Yeah, you did. It tells us about God swearing an oath. He says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. So be that as it may, this mighty angel gives a solemn oath, saying, There should be delay no longer. You know, we're coming around the bend. We're halfway through the Great Tribulation. It's just a matter of time, and we're going to see that God is going to fulfill everything He has declared. Now, look at verse 7. He says, But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, that happens in chapter 11, verse 15, by the way, the mystery of God should would be finished as he declared to his servants the prophets. Now, what's the mystery of God that's about to be declared? Well, that's what the Old Testament prophets spoke of many, many times. It's about the kingdom of God being set up here on planet Earth. That's what it refers to, the mystery of God here. How many times have you prayed the Lord's Prayer? When you do, you are praying for Jesus to come back and set up his kingdom on earth. The Old Testament prophets spoke of the Messiah setting up the kingdom of God on earth, destroying God's enemies and establishing the kingdom on earth where he is going to rule and reign. So every time you've prayed this prayer, Matthew 6, starting in verse 9, this is where Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray. He says, in this manner, therefore, pray, 
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're praying for the kingdom of God to be established on earth. Is it? No. Are we going to make it happen? No. When's it going to happen? When Jesus comes back to earth and establishes his kingdom. When you get into these teachings of amillennialism, they say, oh, there's no kingdom age. Or they'll say, we're living in the kingdom age. I'm really disappointed. If this is the kingdom age, I'm really disappointed. The lame are not leaping like the deer. The blind of the eyes aren't being opened. Jesus gave us a taste when he was here for about three and a half years, when he opened blind eyes, and he says, the kingdom of God is among you. Why? Because the king was here, but he's not here right now. When he comes back, then he will establish the kingdom of God on earth. So he says here, uh, give us this day our daily bread. That's what we're praying for now. We're also praying, you know, that his kingdom would come. Give us, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This is one of the reasons I know we're not in the kingdom age, because the evil one is still very much present. During the kingdom age, Satan is locked away. We'll see this in chapter 20. He's locked into the abyss for a thousand years. He's not going to be part of the kingdom age. He's still part of this age, very much so. So lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. But that desire to see God's kingdom established on earth by the Messiah himself is one of the main themes of the Old Testament, but it's also the reason why most of his Jewish brethren rejected him when he came the first time 2,000 years ago. They were expecting Jesus to come and kick out their enemies. At the time, the Roman Empire, they expected their Messiah to come and set up the kingdom of God here and now. Wipe out his enemies, establish your kingdom. That's what they were looking for. So when Jesus starts talking about, no, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to be betrayed in the hands of sinful men. They're going to beat me up. They're going to nail me to the cross. But I'm going to rise from the dead on the third day. His disciples didn't like it. They didn't believe him. And many of his disciples walked away from him. They did not realize that these same Old Testament prophets spoke of the Messiah being beaten and tortured and nailed to the cross. I read about that in Isaiah 53. You get a clear picture in Psalm 22 where the Lamb of God would be slain for our sins. So when Jesus shows up and he starts talking about his impending death, it didn't make any sense to these first century Jewish people. I mean, after Jesus rose from the grave and was about to send back up into heaven, they're still questioning, what are you doing? Are you going to set up the kingdom now? But they fail to realize, like many people today, that the primary reason he came 2,000 years ago was not to wipe out the enemies of the Jews, but it was to wipe out the worst enemy over all of mankind, which is what? Sin. He came to deal with our sin. The worst enemy of all, because our sin leads to death. Death without Jesus leads to eternal separation in the lake of fire. So that's why he came, to die and shed his blood so that nobody would have to go there. Obviously, brought as a road that leads to eternal damnation. But Jesus came to defeat sin that causes death, that causes separation. And so for everyone who believes in Christ, everybody who receives him by faith, he will change you. He will make you a new creation. He will declare you forgiven, clean, holy, righteous, because now you're not in yourself as a sinner. Now you're in Christ as a new believer, a new creation, a saint. A saint who still sins, but you're saint in God's eyes. How awesome is that? But the fact remains, Jesus Christ is going to establish his kingdom on earth. But the only reason he has not done that yet is because there are still multitudes of people that need to hear the good news. There are still multitudes of people that need to get saved. They need to become part of the spiritual kingdom of God, which is still being built up today. You become part of the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. That is why we're still here. And for the last 2,000 years, everybody who has become followers of Jesus, he has given each and every one of us a special mission. And it's simply, and this is the only reason we're still here. 
If he was done with us, we'd be out of here, but he's not. We're still here because he wants each one of us to be light and salt to those around us. And we do that in one of two ways. First of all, as Christians, we need to live our lives in such a way that people will see Jesus in us because he is in us. They need to see his love, his compassion, his righteousness, his truth, his grace, his mercy. We get this from the Lord. He says in John chapter 13, starting in verse 34, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. As I, as I, <laughs> I don't like that. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. That's impossible. Yeah, it is, but wait. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Again, we're to reflect the love of Jesus to the world around us. He said, love one another even as I have loved you. Again, I look at that and it's like in Ephesians 5 where he says, husbands, love your wife even as Christ loves the church. I go, oh man, I can't do that. How am I going to love Elizabeth the same way? I mean, think about the way Jesus loves you. Perfectly, unconditionally, righteously, amazingly. And I want to love Elizabeth that way, but in my flesh I can't. So how can we love others, love our spouse, love our kids with the love of Jesus by letting the love of Jesus fill us up? And this is exactly what we're told in Romans chapter 5, verse 5. Now hope does not disappoint because, notice, the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And so literally, we are without excuse as Christians not to love others around us with the love of Jesus, but we often do or don't love them because of the fact we're still in these bodies of flesh. And in this body of flesh, I can still grieve the Holy Spirit. I can still quench the Holy Spirit, and I do. You start thinking wrongly, you start doing wrongly, whatever, we can quench and grieve the Holy Spirit. And if we allow a root of bitterness or hatred, I don't like those people. They voted this way, or they did that. Jesus still loves them because he died for them. They look this way. I don't like, you know, no, it doesn't matter. Jesus died for them. And if we just set our minds on earthly things instead of looking to Jesus, we will grieve the Holy Spirit. And the simple solution for all Christians who find, you know, maybe a root of bitterness or anger, and, I, and I, it's happened to me plenty of times, what we need to do is humble ourselves and go to Jesus and confess our sin. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of what? Our sins and to cleanse who? Us from all unrighteousness. John is writing that about himself. It's not just once, ah, oh, I confess when I got saved, now I never need to do it again. Now we repent, means we change our mind when we do something wrong. We change our mind and start doing it God's way again. It doesn't mean you're getting resaved. It just means you're maintaining a good relationship with the Lord. It has nothing to do with your salvation. You just want to have a good relationship with the Lord. So we confess. means agree with God. Oh, man, I've been looking at these people wrong, Lord. I've been judging them. I've been sizing them up. I've been putting them in this camp. Instead of just giving them Jesus. That's all we can do. We need to continue to do that so that they might taste and see that the Lord is good because that's when the rivers of living water start to flow from our lives, and they can become refreshed by us. If we walk in the flesh as Christians and just start beating other people down, running around with our signs, you're going to hell, you wicked sinner. <laughs> we want to do that, right? But if we do, all we're going to do is drive people further away. We come alongside of them. You speak the truth. Jude, it tells us at the end of Jude's book, um, on some save with compassion, on others with fear. I would always encourage you, use compassion, mercy, love first when you approach somebody and they need to hear about Jesus. And then if they cuss you out and get mean and nasty, then put the fear of God into them. Okay, you can reject the Lord. You're not rejecting me, you're rejecting Jesus. The end result of that, if you continue, is a lake of fire. Some with fear. 
Some people get saved when they hear about there is a judgment to come. Most of the time, they just need to hear the grace and goodness of God and Jesus loves them. He died for their sins. But if they don't think they're a sinner, put a little fear of God into their hearts. Nothing wrong with that. So we, we want to represent the Lord by walking in the Spirit, not in the flesh. The second way we reflect the love and goodness of God to this lost and dying world is to be a witness of Christ, for Christ. And again, we do that with our actions, with our, our words, but also with the gospel. You can't get around the fact people need to hear the gospel. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone who believes. I'll get back to that in a moment because nobody's in the sun. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay, go back before that, though. Um, when we look at the disciples, they were still wondering about Jesus setting up his kingdom then. They were getting distracted. Like, we can get distracted. Jesus might come back in 2023. He might. I hope he does. I'm ready, Lord. Get me out of this sick world. It's getting weirder by the minute. They're going after our children. They're trying to give them all these hormone-changing drugs right now, and it's just wicked. 80% of all who go through the trans phase, they do the whole transition thing, 80% within 15 years say, I wish I never would have done that. And yet we're pushing kids into this. You're not really a boy. I think you're a girl. So here, take these drugs. It'll change you. And then we'll start cutting things off. I mean, this is wicked what we're seeing. Why are people doing this to children? Because they don't believe in God. Because one of the things, if you think you're God, then you can decide who lives and who dies. This is why abortion is such a big deal to those who are not saved. They want to play God. If there is no God who created us after his own image and likeness, then that's just a blob in your belly. You need to cut it out get rid of it because they think they know best because they think they're God. We're God. We're going to change your children into what we want them to be instead of who God created them to be. That's playing God. We're living in wicked times. So let me get back to not being distracted. Because <laughs> it's easily, we get distracted, but we need to keep the main thing the main thing, which is Jesus Christ, and He's coming back for us, and we need to be ready, watching, living for Him. Um, a great example, the early disciples being distracted. Remember, Jesus died. He rose from the dead. He's appearing to them over 40 years you know, 40 day period and 40 day period. And then he's about to ascend up into heaven. And the very last conversation they have is, are you now going to set up the kingdom of God on earth? That's what they wanted. Well, I don't blame them. That's what I want. But this is what they, we read. Acts 1 verse 6. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times and season seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, that's our Grand Junction, and in all Judea, that's our Colorado, in Samaria, the United States, and to the end of the earth. And that's what we need to be doing. That's what we're doing. We're doing it, go give hope in India, go give hope in Africa. I mean, we're doing our part as a little church. We do what we can. I mean, we saw last year 3,000 people get saved, 1,500 former Muslims get saved, over 200 churches start. It's crazy what God's doing. So he's not done yet, but we need to be witnesses to him. Not just witness about him, but be witnesses in how we live our lives and how we share the gospel. That is the power of God unto salvation. So look for those opportunities. Jesus is going to set up his kingdom on earth. I believe in the very near future. And again, we're going to look at chapters and scenes, like even next week, if we're still around, uh, Revelation 11, we're going to see that there is going to be a temple built on the Temple Mount. In March, we're going to try to get up on the Temple Mount as we go to Israel again. And we're going to see where that temple is going to be built for the antichrist that's what it's about because when jesus returns he's going to wipe that temple away but we're seeing signs we are in the last days things are falling into place but in the meantime 
Matthew 5, 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now check this out. We'll wrap it up here quickly. I know some of you are anxious to go home and watch the Broncos lose. <laughs> they're playing Kansas City. I think they're probably in maybe the end of the first or second course. Starting, anyway, they're like a possum. They're on the road today, <laughs> so they're going to get killed. So, uh, Verse 8, I'll eat my words if they win, but I'm pretty confident. Verse 8, then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. If you went to a restaurant and they told you that, I don't think you'd want to stay. Probably not. But then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. And, and that's the rest of the book, the rest of the prophecies in Revelation. There aren't these strange orders? Take this little book, the scroll. When I look at a scroll, I'm reminded of a burrito. I, my favorite food has always been Mexican food. I love burritos. Usually when I try a New Mexican restaurant, I always have to have the burrito because that's my measurement stick. Big burrito. But, I mean, can you imagine? It's like take this little burrito and eat it. So I'm, I'm thinking burrito, yeah. I'm going to put a little salsa on there, a little guacamole. I should have checked the date on the sour cream because it was off. Because he tasted, oh, this is so good. It gets into his belly, oh, this is bitter, this is nasty, this is gross, this is not good. So basically, that's what John is tasting right now. It's good, but now it's very, very harsh because he's experiencing the bitterness, the heartache of realizing just how brutal the final judgments, starting with the, bowl, or the first bold judgment, those final seven judgments are going to be brutal beyond our comprehension. The sweetness of knowing that the end is near and that Jesus is coming back, that's going to be glorious. But in the meantime, it's going to be a bitter pill to swallow. Again, we're at the new year. I encourage you, I exhort you, get into the Word of God. Go through all of God's Word. Did you find those back there? Awesome. So on the in the information booth, there's these little pamphlets. Just take one, take two if you need one for your spouse and you know, stick in their lunchbox and manipulate them. No, don't do that. <laughs> never work. It never works. But it takes you through all the scriptures throughout the year. It's just a little outline that helps you get through the Bible in a year. I encourage you because as you go through the whole counsel of God's word from Genesis to Revelation period, there are many wonderful promises you're going to read. There are many difficult things you're going to read about. There are many warnings of discipline. There's many corrections. There's trials and tribulations, promises that you don't have on your refrigerator. But that's what Bible study is all about, reading. And then when you study the Bible rightly, you're assimilating God's word into your life. Just like John ate this, the words, the prophecies, he assimilated it into his life. As you go through God's word, you're assimilating it. It becomes part of you. The Holy Spirit will bring a verse to remembrance. It's just the right moment because it's living, it's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. We have great examples of feasting on the Word of God. This is one, Jer Jeremiah 15, verse 16. I'll close with these verses. Um, the prophet wrote, Your words were found, and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. So Jeremiah, he's down, he's out, he's discouraged. Nobody's getting saved. He wanted to throw in the towel. He gets arrested, thrown in the dungeon. 
And he's like, I'm just not even going to speak of your word anymore. And then he says it was like a burning in his heart. i got to speak the word of God. I just got to let people know. Psalm 119, 103 says, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Jesus says in Matthew 4, 4, But he answered and said, this is when he's coming against Satan, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Peter calls the word of God what? Milk. Paul calls it meat. And so you've got honey. The word of God is like honey. It's like meat. It's like bread. It's like milk. In other words, feast upon the word of God. It's so important to read and heed and assimilate the word of God into our lives because once again, only the living, powerful word of God can satisfy, nourish your thirsty soul. You're not going to get it from watching Fox News or, God forbid, CNN. I, I flip on CNN for about five minutes, and I say, I can't do this. Because people say, look at the other side. I don't want to. <laughs> I look at the other side, and it's like, you're a bunch of idiots. What are you doing? How could you believe that? You put it on Fox, and it's like, oh, man, they're saying the same thing. I should have just watched one half hour early in the morning, and I get the same story throughout the day. Right? Oh, well, sorry. <laughs> Another little rant. Anyway, go to the Word of God. Spend your time being nourished, satisfied in God's Word. And so like the apostles of old, like the prophets of old, May we feed daily upon the Word of God, because as we do, that's how our faith grows. And I hear it all the time, I just want to have stronger faith. I just want my faith to be stronger in these days in which we live. I don't want to give in to my flesh. Well, I need stronger faith. How does that happen? It's our theme verse that we've had for 33 years now, Romans 10, 17. So then, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And that's because God's Word is truth. God's Word is a light. It's a lamp. It gives us wisdom, discernment, hope, and joy. We find Jesus in the Word of God. Period. Period.